morning, everybody, and welcome. Thank you all for coming. I'm A.J. Josephowitz, and welcome to Conversation Corps. Conversation Corps' mission is to engage the people in Aust of Austin in a meaningful dialogue around public issues, and this month's issue is parking and transit. The vision of the program is to make conversation and engagement easy and comfortable for everybody. So I hope everybody's relaxed and ready to participate, and we really appreciate your being here. I'll explain first how the process will work, and then we'll jump right into it. So we think of it in terms of being in four rounds. In the first round, we'll simply go around and introduce each other so that everybody can know who's here. And then in the second round, each of you will have an opportunity to talk about the matter from your perspective, and that'll be uninterrupted. So each person will have voice and talk about uh, issues that are on their mind re relevant to parking and transit. In the third round, we'll engage in dialogue. So we'll have an opportunity to question each other, debate with each other, and just dialogue around everything that we heard in round two. And then in round four, we'll simply summarize everything, and that'll be the wrap. All set? Yeah. Sounds good. Okay, so I'll start, and then we need not go around in a circle, but we can. I'm A.J. Josephowitz, and I'm a leadership and organization development consultant and coach here in Austin, and I am a former uh, board member of Leadership Austin, and I am extending my connection with Leadership Austin, that wonderful organization, by participating in these conversations. Who would like to go next? I will go. Hi, I'm Sam Alexander. I've been in Austin for about seven years now. Um, started my career working with the city, now work for the school district. Um, truly love the city and um, am pretty embracing of alternative transportation, so I'm excited for this conversation. Thanks, Sam. I'm Laura. Um, I've been in Austin for two years now. I work for the customer service team here with community engagement uh, in AISD. And um, yeah, I've, I've experienced public transportation. I am, an, uh, I, I like riding my bike uh, around town, so that's, I'm excited to be here. Thanks. I'm Amit Motwani. Uh, I've lived in Austin for 20 years. I am a, a longtime nonprofit administrator uh, and data consultant. Wonderful. I'm Julie Smith. I work at Leadership Austin. I actually have the, the privilege of, of, of running the, the pilot phase of Conversation Core um, is something that Leadership Boston is very excited to be a part of um, in terms of bringing people together and having important conversations about the things that are shaping our city is really important to us. I'm actually here today to be AJ's co-host. I'll be jotting down some notes and helping to summarize at the end so that we can deliver your feedback to the agencies who are seeking input. Um, so we will not be participating. We're here to, to just be neutral facilitators. Um, and again, thank you for coming and sharing your thoughts. My name is Jacob Calhoun, and I'm a long-range transportation planner with Capital Metro. Um, I've been off and on in Austin for about six, seven years, and just looking to make Austin a much more multimodal and transit-friendly city. Excellent. Thank you. My name is Sylvia Alexander. I've been in Austin for 13 years, and um, living in Austin, what I've discovered is I really love the energy here, and so I've really, um, you know, um, made Austin my home. and. Um, keep it very close to my heart. So being here is um, an important day for me. Thank you. I'm Tiffany Young. I've been in Austin about 10 years now. I used to work at Community Impact, so I've written about transportation and now work downtown at Austin ISD. So lots of uh, transportation excursions. <laughs> so after listening to everybody's introductions, I realized that I failed to mention that I've lived in Austin for about 21 years now. <laughs> And it's a great town, and like any of you who've lived here a while, or, and maybe even those of you who just got here, we're all feeling the growth. I also failed to mention at the beginning, and I apologize, that this initiative, Conversation Core, is a partnership between the city of Austin, Capital Metro, Austin ISD, and Travis County. And it is being supported and facilitated by Leadership Austin. So I think we're ready to go. Julie, I'm glad you mentioned that you'll be jotting notes. Mm -hmm. So we'll turn to you when we get to the summary and see what you have to say. Perfect. Okay, thanks. So um, let's just uh, jump into it. The generic question, but take it wherever you want to go, is what makes it easy <coughs> or difficult for you to get around? 
town where you need to go and what ideas, suggestions, recommendations do you have to make it even better? And uh, again, let's, in this stage, we'll go uninterrupted and um, who would like to begin? I guess I'll go. Um, <laughs> uh, what makes it easy for me to get around is having options. Um, I live in an area of town on the north side where we have uh, access to the metro rail line, access to metro rapid, access to various local buses. I can drive if I need to. I can bike. Um, there's plenty of options up there, and there's plenty of things that I want to go to, so that helps me a lot. Uh, what makes it difficult is um, not all areas of town are equally as robust as where I live. Um, there are lots of issues with traffic, of course, throughout the city, and uh, not all of the roads are capable of handling as many people that are on them. So uh, maybe more connections also would help too. Um, some of the areas, it feels like there's only a few ways to get to certain parts of town. And we only have so many bridges, we only have so many roads that intersect everywhere. Uh, so uh, just ways to move about easier would be helpful. Thank you, Jack. No problem. Who'd like to go next? It's kind of a trick question. What makes it easy to get around <laughs> Austin? <laughs> uh, you could say nothing. What would <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Options definitely would make it uh, easier. Uh, I do find uh, that our options are increasing, uh, despite the fact that, they're, uh, that growth is surely outpacing them. Uh, what would make it better uh, would be a little bit, uh, actually a lot, improved predictability. Uh, you know, I, I do think, you know, I, I live in East Austin, and uh, I've, I've lived all around town for, for quite a while, and I do think that uh, our bus uh, transit service is excellent, uh, given, I think, obvious limitations, but I think the challenge is traffic and not being able to necessarily predict when you're going to be able to arrive at a certain place. Uh, and I think the folks uh, who are riding the bus are, you know, dealing with, with challenges and being able to arrive at their jobs on time, at their job interviews on time. Uh, and having been in the nonprofit world for so, for so long, I've been able to see directly how, you know, that, that impacts folks who are uh, heavily dependent on the bus lines. Not to mention that, you know, families who are riding the bus tend to have compounded costs when you have multiple family members riding the bus together. I think, I think uh, improved accessibility and also improved predictability, presumably rail uh, options could help uh, with, with things like predictability, but, you know, we understand those limitations as well. Thank you. Very good. Uh, for me, what makes it easy is I have a small car, <laughs> so I can park in most places. Um, but what I find difficult is having other options besides driving. Um, I've tried the Metro Rail, and the closest one to me is the ACC Highland, but if you park there more than one day in a row, you get a little sticker on your car that says you will be towed. So I think it's great that we have the Metro Rail, but as far as accessibility, if you're not going to ride your bike there, it's a little difficult. For me personally, I don't have access to any of that. I only have access to the bus system. Um, and I ride my bike everywhere when I'm not heading to work um, because traffic, I live in East Austin right off of I-35 and um, Oldorf, so that area gets so congested in the morning and it's dangerous for me to ride my bike. <clears throat> um, so I don't do that in the mornings and I come to work and I do have a compact, compact car so that makes it easier for me or at least with traffic. Um, but I don't have access to any of that, so I think, yeah, maybe increasing that, um, putting that in different places in the city, making it more accessible would make it easier for me. Okay. You know, I actually um, enjoy driving throughout <coughs> Austin, even with all the traffic congestion construction, um, because it gives me an opportunity to um, look really, you know, look at what's around and enjoy, you know, what new businesses and et cetera, but coming from 
22 and 620, there's absolutely no bus system out there. And it being hilly, you know, um, it's almost impossible to ride your bike unless you're um, a professional rider. <laughs> um, but what I've discovered is when my car was down is I didn't have any way to get around. There was no bus, you know, and actually it's, it's quite dangerous to walk around because 620 is such a busy road um, as well as 22. And, um, you know, my thought was that, you know, we could probably use a little bit more hidden trails um, to get around when things are down. So, um, I'll agree with the choices statement. I think having as many choices as possible is what makes it easy to get around. So everything from bus to car to go to TNCs to bike, walk, I mean, it, there are all of those choices. Um, and I really, in particular, am reliant on our bus system and then also driving my personal vehicle when I need to. I think what makes it difficult is um, kind of hacking the system, if you will, and figuring out how do you use all of those choices in sync or in some sort of flow that meets your needs. Um, and then there are different payment systems on every single choice as well. So finding a way that you can, you can you know, maybe use the bus to get to close to downtown, then take a car to go to your final stop or take a B cycle to your final stop and working that all together. Um, I think something that could make it better would be some sort of like consistent platform across all of them. Um, but also, yeah, I live in a part of town, I live in South Austin and you mentioned predict predictability. I would go reliability, I think same difference, but whenever you're dependent on that last bus connection, you know, mine is the last two mile connection to get home. And either it would be there on time and it's a great, perfect ride home, or there's an extra hour, well, extra 40 minute wait for the next one to come to get home. And luckily I'm an able-bodied person, so I can walk the two miles home if I need to. And sometimes that's a very enjoyable part of my day. Sure. Other times it's, you know, a choice to wait. So that reliability factor is really helpful. Okay, I think we've heard from everybody. Thank you all very much for your comments. So now let's mix it up a little bit. What did you hear from what somebody else might have said that uh, provoked some additional thoughts? Maybe even some questions that you might have from what you heard from other people. I actually did a, a little bit of research on this just on how um, surveys that have been done for the public. And um, I actually, um, you know, I... On, just in my daily life, I don't constantly think about, oh, how can I improve traffic in the city or how am I going to get to work better? <laughs> um, so reading these surveys was really eye-opening how all of these options that people are coming up with on how to improve transportation. Um, and I think one of the ones that kind of stands out to me is the underground I-35 um, idea. I didn't read much of it, but that just seems like, I mean, is that... How would that even work? Um, and uh, another one that I wanted to mention is the bus option for just the bus lane. Um, I know when I first moved to Austin, we didn't have a vehicle. So we both, both my husband and I had to do the bus and I was always with my little one in her car seat. Um, and buses are not very child friendly. Uh, friends of mine that have kids as well that do use the bus transportation also agree. Um, so how would um, maybe, putting it out there, putting these surveys actually out there because I was only able to find news of those surveys <clears throat> on the website, on the um, Capital Metro website. So I hadn't seen it anywhere else. So I'm going to be kind of putting that out there more and how is, has there been conversations on increasing or making buses more child-friendly, baby transportation friendly? Okay, very good. So um, I, I don't want to cut this off if that's where it's going, mm -hmm. but the, the topic today is uh, transit and parking. And you all had an opportunity to get briefed a little bit about this before we got started. And as we all observe, we have been focused disproportionately, almost exclusively, on transit. Um, so it begs to me the question, why is that? I, you know, my hunch would be, well, it's more relevant. But do we, do we want to say anything about parking or, or do we want, and the thinking behind this was that the two topics are connected 
because the larger topic is mobility and people's ability to get where they want to go in town and the choices are to drive or to use uh, public transportation. So anything about parking that anybody would like to mention? Parking is definitely a very important tie with transit. Um, it's been studied how if there is more kind of free or reduced parking, the incentive to use transit is less because supply is out there. So people just take up the supply. And um, therefore, it's less, okay, well, I need to take this line in order to get close to my destination. It's more of, well, I'll just drive straight there. Mm -hmm. um, so having parking at such a low rate can affect adversely the transit use within the city. Uh, so it's important to know that parking, while great, and it's great to be able to have that flexibility and great to have the ability to have your spot um, can lead to lots of driving for people. And most likely as rates increase downtown, the percentage of people that will choose to drive uh, will decrease because they don't want to have to, or their company doesn't want to have to pay to house parking for them because parking is real estate and real estate is expensive. So question, are we trying to eliminate people driving and trying to encourage them to use transit? I wouldn't say that it's the question of an either or kind of thing. I'd say it's more of that choice option. Um, I think that having a sea of parking is adverse to transit. Mm -hmm. And having transit everywhere probably takes up some real estate that could be used for parking, but most likely not because most of the parking is the destination type of thing. It's the buildings, it's the places you work, the places you live, the places you go to drink, eat, have fun. And the convenience. Exactly. Um, that convenience is definitely there, but you can also have convenient transit service mm -hmm. if there is places for it to go to. Sure. I know for myself that as a woman, um, I find it way more convenient and, and um, safe mm -hmm. for me to drive myself there, park in a spot where I feel comfortable, and then leave. <laughs> oh, I, I understand. Uh, you do get the kind of protection of the car, so yes. there's nobody to worry about harassing you exactly. or uh, staring at talking me. at you or staring mm -hmm. at you. But the other thing with that is you also lose that kind of social ability to talk to people sure. as well. So you, while you are in your car, you're kind of isolated mm -hmm. from other people, and you don't get to find out about maybe some place that you'd like to go, like a concert that's going on in town, sure. or maybe even just get to know people from your neighborhood mm -hmm. type of thing, um, just because you get in your, well, take your car out of your garage, go to wherever you're going, and then who have you talked to within that time? One thing I would add to that, too, is I, I personally feel safer using transit mm -hmm. because I'm not a distracted driver. I'm mm -hmm. not... Whenever you get in the car, you know, sometimes you drive five miles and maybe you don't remember the past five miles. You know, you're on Mopac and you're just in, in it to get to your end destination. So I actually feel safer using transit because there's less of a human error factor on my side of it. And then if I want to read emails or read a book, I can do that. Um, but I think also in regards to parking, to your original question, um, I think the reason maybe why we're leaning towards transit is me personally, parking is not a challenge in my life. Um, whenever I come downtown, usually I'm coming down for a good period of time. So I'm not looking for on-street parking. I know the garages that I'll go to and pay for parking. And given that we are the 11th largest city in the nation, I think our parking is really affordable. I mean, maybe, I mean, it's very low compared nationwide. Sure. So for me, it's just not a challenge. Whereas I would like to make mass transit a bigger part of my life. Mm -hmm. And so that's why whenever we ask the question, my focus goes to mass transit rather than parking. Because you I, want it more. I want it more. Yeah. The parking, um, there's enough parking. And again, I'm the type of person who would park, you know, a mile away and enjoy the walk-in. Mm -hmm. Sure. Absolutely. Yes, please. Well, and I think parking, it, it can be a challenge. I mean, we can find ways around it. But I, I think to your point of safety, you were meaning more physical, like walking further to your destination, right? Well, sure. Is and, uh, more... you know, the journey. I mean, it's not, mm -hmm. I mean, it's going, it's not from point A to point B. It's from point to A to other. point D, you know. And so during that period, there's um, a number of people that at times, you know, we don't quite feel comfortable with. 
um, nor do I want to spark up a conversation um, because I don't want other, um, you know, Something behavior falling. rising. So, yeah. you know, um, when I take the transit, it's because my daughter and I are on a journey and we're going to enjoy Austin and we've got time to take the bus and go from point A to point D and we're not on a schedule. Right. It's all about enjoying the experience. Yeah. I think it's also uh, important to point out that one of the sort of the implications of easily available or accessible parking or low price parking uh, was that it encourages driving more. So I guess the contrapositive of that is that increased cost parking or more expensive parking or less available parking would somehow be a deterrent uh, to, to driving. Um, and I think that's, that's an interesting thought. And I think, you know, whenever parking, as this uh, briefing sort of implies, parking at some point is going to hit, we're going to hit our carrying capacity no matter what the prices are going to be. We're already hovering at 90%. Uh, and, you know, with anybody who knows what the growth rate of Austin has been like knows that during the day and during the, ev during the evening, pretty soon, within a few years, if uh, growth continues as it has been, it's going to be maxed out. So the only, the only option will be to increase prices. Uh, so that's sort of a fixed variable. The question is, you know, is the parking policy as a deterrent to folks driving in, is, is that what we want the paramount uh, sort of focus of, of parking policy to be? Or should it be a more global sort of approach? Uh, to create a healthy mix of transit and and uh, you know commuting in by vehicle, I think we've done a lot of great things with parking. I mean, I, I like the two wheel vehicle policy. I like uh, you know the fact that bike racks have been made far more available around town. Uh, I like car to go and being able to park them almost anywhere. Uh, I think I think we've done a lot of great things with parking, but I don't know that you know necessarily. Uh, making parking less available as a deterrent to folks commuting in or as a, as a, as a component of a, an all-around sort of deterrent plan or, or promotion plan of folks using transit uh, is necessarily uh, a clean justification. I don't think it works like that in a vacuum. I do think, and I've thought for a while, that Austin ought to perhaps, if we are moving in a direction of making... Uh, sort of cost penalizing uh, uh, commuting, you know, Austin might look into something like what London, bit, London did back in 2002 or 2003, which was the congestion charge for entering, uh, you know, the, 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 the inner city, the central yeah. district. And that would improve the parking situation, and that would definitely uh, encourage the use of transit while discouraging necessarily the use of uh, you know individual vehicles for commuting and I think that's more of a global approach as opposed it's a system -wide to system-wide yeah, thing. One thing I would add to your point going off this sheet so when we talk about the raising the cost as a deterrent or to people driving single occupancy mm -hmm. vehicles downtown is whenever we talk availability of parking too is that with the cost staying low we're not creating more available parking we're actually maintaining this 97, 90% capacity rate downtown. So there's, and that's just on-street parking, so not garages, but with the on-street parking, by keeping it low, we're actually making it more difficult for people to find on-street parking still. And so then I think that factors into that. That serves as a that deterrent potentially question as well, right? Is, mm -hmm. And, you know, because people, you'll hear people, hear people saying like, oh, you know, you remember the days where you couldn't drive downtown and there was always available parking on the street. Um, and now you drive downtown and you feel pretty lucky if you find that open spot on the street, um, and that's only going to get more and more difficult if we don't change it a little bit. And I think, you know, right now at a buck an hour in the 11th largest city is still... It's pretty easy. You can uh, hold off on one appetizer and get yourself like seven hours of parking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think, I think that sort of... Uh, I think there's a balance. That's yeah, I, I, there's a balance I, with that pricing. I, like right now it's probably really too low, not uh -huh. that it should go sky high to make it unaffordable, right? but a balance between those two. Right. And the question would be, who, whom does that affect? You know, there are some folks who a 20% increase in parking won't affect. That's not going to make a difference in whether or not they rotate their parking out tonight. Uh, and their inconvenience factor is therefore very small. Mm -hmm. And there are some folks who that 20% increase would affect dramatically more. 
And those folks are the ones who maybe don't get to hold off for the appetizer that they only get to really enjoy once, maybe a month or two months, because eating downtown is an intense luxury for them. Um, and and so I think, again, you know, if uh, the the approach shouldn't be in a vacuum. It mm-hmm. should be it should be definitely something that's entirely considered. And I do think uh, perhaps an examination or uh, into what folks main purposes are uh, maybe a survey I, I, I don't know you know how to even begin this outreach but you know what folks are doing downtown during certain hours and how long they they typically are downtown you know uh, trying to get downtown during the day for a meeting if you need to go to city hall even uh, it, it could be tough if that garage is full you're I mean and you you have to be somewhere on time or if you have to get uh, you know get uh, to a, a committee meeting or something on time it can be really, really stressful and difficult if you're, if you're coming from an office elsewhere. Uh, and you may need to be able to have parking for X amount of time. Um, or if you are coming for an event in the evening and you, need to, you, you might need to have parking for a certain amount of time. Uh, I don't know that, y- you know, sometimes they're just not options that are going to allow you to rotate out. And I, I don't know when people come to downtown, are they coming, if somebody's coming, for a period where they could be, they could easily rotate out their parking for an hour. Uh, does that mean that they otherwise wouldn't have done that anyway? You know. Um. Yeah, that's a good point because there's very rarely times that I'm just meeting someone for dinner. If I am, regardless, I'm going to stay there a certain amount right. of time. But if I'm going downtown with my friends, we're staying at least until late. That's mm-hmm. the whole. You didn't get ready. To go home. <laughs> Better rotate out. Uh, yeah, so uh, it doesn't matter how, it, to, sure. to people like me, it wouldn't matter. And like you said, people who it's really going to matter to, it might be a special occasion. Or they have to be there because they're going to a place mm-hmm. that they need to take care of business. Well, so. the hope there is that if they can't pay that extra 20 cents per hour, <clears throat> that they would find alternative modes in order to still enjoy what they're looking to do. So that's where transit and the nine hour service and that kind of thing comes into play, where you have another option um, that is, like there will be a certain price point where the cost of transit and the cost of parking kind of tips the balance. Uh, so having access to transit and being able to have, be able to still go out and do what you wanna do is something that would be an option at that point. It's not just, oh, well, I need to drive, but I have to pay an extra, 20 cents every hour, it's, well, I could choose to take transit instead. Or it is interesting hearing either, because when you say 20%, that's definitely a different message than 20 cents. I I mean, I think it is important, you know, 20% of a dollar. So if we're talking 20 cents, three hour maximum, it's a 60 cent difference. Mm -hmm. I I do think that's important to, to keep in mind that it's that difference and that they talk about all 20 cents of the increased paid meter parking will go towards congestion measures. And I think whenever we talk about transportation in the city, we're always talking about congestion and what things people can do with, you know, to improve congestion. So if that, if that extra max 60 cents is going to improving congestion, I think that's part of the, the full conversation. Yeah, exactly. And I'd be curious what those measures are uh, and how, you know, realistic uh, it would be to think that that those 20 cents are going to you know, I, I would like to know what the projected revenue might be and what the, you know, uh, implications would be on congestion improvement policy and whether or not that were a piecemeal sort of idea as opposed to uh, a systemic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I so think it's you, a system-wide gonna, signal sorry. upgrade mm-hmm. from what you I'm going to say. Something. Oh, that's good. Well, ago. yes. You know, my concern is that, um, and this is, you know, speaking for people who can't um, afford parking or um as meters increase, um, you know, so are parking tickets. They're going to increase. And, um, and possibly warrants are going to increase because those people who couldn't afford to pay the meter um, are certainly not going to be capable of paying a $20 ticket. And therefore, those are going to accumulate and, um, and a warrant will occur. Why will the ticket increase because the parking well, on street parking is increasing. Well, because as meter meters increase, um, people are going to take the risk of 
not paying it. So you're saying not the cost of the ticket, but the frequency of receiving a ticket. Yes. Mm. Okay. So thank you all for focusing on the parking issue. I, I want to flip us back one last time. One last kind of <laughs> open question. And, and much of this you've already said, so it could be repetitive, but here's the question. What would it take? What would it take to increase your ridership on the transit system from where it is today? We could extend the 803 south on Westgate <laughs> from, <laughs> from the Westgate Mall down to Slaughter. To Slaughter. Okay. That was my very specific thoughtful <laughs> invite. Fine. That's <laughs> fine. Because I, and that's what I was looking for. Thank okay. You. <laughs> I feel like, uh, Sam? Yes. I feel like Sam's uh, suggestion earlier about an integrated scheme uh, for uh, charging, um, you know, when it comes to co uh, transit systems that we have, whether it's, you know, whether they're public, whether it's car to go, uh, what have you, some sort of integrated scheme for that. There are great apps out there that can help you kind of get from point A to point Q. Um, and they'll kind of aggregate all the information for you, but to have uh, maybe an integrated scheme uh, so that one can have a, just a better, predict more predictable idea of what their cost might be. Um, and, you know, just all around, that's, it would be easier. It would be better. No, and certainly not my original idea. I have heard it from people far more integrated in, in all of that than I, but that, yeah, it sounded like something that would just make it. I mean, because it's solutions oriented, it's working with what we do have. Well, essentially, yeah. what it's doing is taking barriers well. down. Right. Yes. So it's like, okay, well, I can do this, but then I have to go through this loophole, and then I have to go through this other platform that says, okay, let's just connect everything and then do it from there. Um, the other thing is that, you know, when we say that ridership is down, that's an indicator. Uh, it's an indicator of something. And, you know, when, when demand is down, uh, you know, that could mean that it, it typically has a variety of uh, implications. And, but I could say that, you know, maybe the value that somebody's paying for that transportation is not, uh, you know, the, the individual might not feel that she or he's getting the value uh, uh, for, for what they might be paying for that transportation. And I do know that, you know, a mom who's taking her three kids to summer camp uh, to a day camp, uh, you know, at a nonprofit, for example, that I used to <coughs> work at, is spending a lot of money on on round trips going daily, um, and I don't know exactly what uh, the policy is for students, whether they're um, K twelve students or whether they're uh, uh, university students, uh, but I bet there are probably ways to improve that ridership. I know when I when I came here for school, it was free for us. Um, but I don't know if it's like that anymore. Is ACC it, and uh, UT. It's free. But and not, what about K-12? Not K-12, I don't. I'd have to check in on that. It's not free, I don't think, for, for kids. Um, I don't know yet. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, well, you know, you think about that, but there... parents who have, a, I mean, you know, who have kids, I mean, one might imagine that, uh, uh, you know, once you have one or two kids and you're paying for, for, for three going round trip, that's a rip off. Um, mm -hmm. I feel, yeah, I, I can totally, going back to me as a parent, I think that just safety for younger children is super important. I have a lot of friends, even daycare moms that, you know, we kind of go out and just enjoy the city on the bus and sometimes we don't feel that our kids are safe on the bus. So, so, you know, we drive our cars now. So that was one important thing. And then I know my husband works downtown um, he's a bar owner, so he, I mean, he was spending over $300 a month on bus transit and car to goes and, and all that, so he was like, I cannot do this, so we ended up getting a car for him, because he said, well, that's what I would be spending on gas if I was in a compact car, so that was very difficult, you know, to kind of make that decision and kind of go and to those extremes because of the cost of, tra of transit, using daily transit do two or three times a day because he goes and manages and then goes in at night. So it was uh, a big decision we had to make. Thank you. Anybody else on the specific question of what would increase your likelihood to use public transit? Well, certainly diversity, like he was saying. Um, you know, secondly, um, <clears throat> You know, I want to go from point A to point B. <laughs> yeah. 
you know, if I have to take more than two buses, then I'd rather drive. Um, you know, I don't mind taking two buses, but anything beyond that is just seems troublesome. Yes, connections. Okay. So yeah. as far as the diversity, when you're talking about that, you're thinking more of like coverage sort of thing. Like just, you have more areas to get to. Well, when I'm talking about diversity, I'm talking about the people on the bus. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> in terms of your location spot, maybe in something we haven't mentioned, but more park and rides. Um, if you live further out where you don't want to take three buses to get into the sure. city, maybe having more convenient park and rides on the outskirts of the city so mm -hmm. that if you do have to drive your personal vehicle sure. out, you can at least catch the line in to point B. So point A is your park and ride. Sure. That makes sense. They're on the way. I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Last call. Um, Anything. Oh, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, for About me. Transit. Yes. yes for me, it would have to be as easy as possible. If I go to New York or if I go to San Francisco, I can figure it out. As soon as I get off the, the plane, I go to whatever it is, and there's no question you can figure it out. I feel like even though there's a there's a bus stop near my house, but there's no signage, there's no there's nothing that tells me this is how you this is how you do this. Yes. Here's a map. This you know. So I think it just has to be a little bit easier for anybody who's coming to that system to be like, oh, yep, I've got this. Perfect. Thank you. Removing more barriers. Yeah. So last call. Anything that you haven't had a chance to say about these matters that you'd like to? We're sorely missing, I think, a more extensive rail network, but I, th I understand, uh, you know, having been here so long, I've, I've watched it all happen, and uh, it's just unfortunate. That's all. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, I want to thank you all very much. Very engaging and thoughtful conversation. A lot got covered. And Julie, if I can turn it over to you and kind of summarize for us what we've all said and heard this last yeah. 45 minutes. Absolutely. So I've been um, jotting down notes and, and kind of pulling out some themes. Um, and that's those themes is, are what we'll pass along. And so I want to make sure that um, I've heard you. And we don't in any way need to agree on everything, um, but just agree that, yes, this is what, what, what was said during our conversation. So I would say the, one of the biggest things that stuck out to me was this global perspective, thinking about things systematically integrating um, not only our thoughts, but our the options that we have, how we pay for them. Um, we all talked a lot about options and access to options. So whether that means bringing rail to more areas of town, extending bus lines, um, <clears throat> those sort of things, the predictability and reliability of the, the systems that we already have needs to be addressed. You all talked a lot about the just the experience of your travel, and that the experience looks different for everyone. Some people enjoy being in the car and kind of soaking in what happens during traffic. Others enjoy the, the social aspect to, to being on public transit. Um, being Having children on public transit was difficult. Um, safety is part of that experience. Some find it more safe to take public transit, but others want to have that control of their own. Um, so experience was a, was a large piece of what you all talked about. Um, and then the last one that I would say really surfaced was cost implications. So what does it mean to certain people? What does that cost mean to them in their personal lives? How does that impact them? Also, how will the money be used? Um, and will it, in fact, deter people? And is that the system that we want? Is that what we're looking for? Um, I know a lot was said, but I would say those are the main themes that came up. What am I missing? I think extending the 803 was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> 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 See my front door. <laughs> On demand. <laughs> That'd be great. Okay. Actually, yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And I will certainly have subpoints for, for all of these and, and try to capture as, as much of what was said as possible. Well, okay, so on behalf of the city of Austin, CAT Metro, Austin ISD, Travis County, and Leadership Austin, I'd like to thank you all very, very much for your time, for your thoughts, and for your participation. And I wish you all a safe ride wherever you're going from. <laughs> thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you, AJ. Thanks, AJ.